In this third question, we're asked to determine which of the following is the correct name for this Hayworth projection. The correct answer is B. If you want to know why, stay tuned right now. Okay, here we are at this question. We're given a Hayworth projection of some form of glucose. Is it alpha D? Is it beta D? Is it alpha L or beta L? Or some weird combination of the above. For me, the easiest way to do this is to convert the Hayworth projection into a chair projection. That might not sound easy to you, but it is to me because I just understand chair projections because I've been doing them for a really long time. Now, I have memorized that chair projections look kind of like slanty bow ties. Can you see that? If a bow tie were, you know, a little bit tipsy. And, and that, that would be one form. And then the enantiomer of this would be this guy. That is the mirror image of this. So these are the two different bow tie chairs for uh, basic sugar monosaccharide. So the guy on the left is, and I've memorized this, D. The guy over here on the uh, right is L. Now D is the natural form of glucose and L is the unnatural form. Why in the world is glucose the most prevalent monosaccharide in nature? The reason is because it is the only monosaccharide that has the ability to place all of its substituents in the equatorial position. So what we're going to do is we're going to dust off our knowledge of how to draw equatorial and axial substituents. And if you're a little bit rusty on this, you're welcome to review another video that I've posted that shows you how to do this. We're going to go ahead and look at this position. That looks like an arrow kind of pointing down, so my axial at that position will go straight down. This looks kind of like an arrow pointing up, so an axial will go straight up. Here it goes straight down, straight up. This one goes kind of straight down, and then that's it. Where do my equatorials go? Well, I look at each position and I find out what its axial is doing. Here at this position, my axial is going down, so my equatorial goes slightly slanted up. Here, my axial is going up, so my equatorial must go slightly slanted down, and then it continues in that pattern, up, down, and then we're pretty much done. I've already labeled the equatorial here as being my CH2OH, which is indeed this group right there. Now, let's do the same thing over here really quickly. I've, of course, not left myself enough room on the board because I am an imbecile. There we go. And then I'll draw my little axial going down. Okay, now all we have to do is figure out which, we have to figure out where to put all of these things. So I've got an oxygen right here in the upper right hand corner that matches my D structure, which means this guy right here, this carbon right there is the carbon right there. Now that carbon happens to be called the anomeric carbon and this is the anomeric oxygen. Now, I told you earlier that glucose always wants to place all of its substituents in an equatorial position. In fact, it can do that. The one exception is at this position, the anomeric carbon. Sometimes this OH will be pointed up in an equatorial fashion, sometimes it won't. It depends on which isomer, also called anomer, of glucose you're talking about. In this case, we've got OH pointing up here at my anomeric carbon. Which position does that correspond to, the equatorial or the axial? Of course, it's going to be the equatorial. I'll draw my OH going up. I've got my H going down. Now I'm at my next carbon right here, which corresponds to this carbon right there. H is going up, OH is going down. Next carbon right here, which is this carbon right here, OH is going up, H is going down. OH is going down here, H is going up there. And then over here, I've got a CH2OH with an H tucked underneath. That is the chair structure of this Hayworth projection. Now, how in the world do I know that it's D instead of L? Well, in order for me to have this guy be an L, I'd have to make sure that my, o that my oxygen is rotated so that it's in the same position three-dimensionally as the oxygen here, which means that I'd have to like kind of rotate it a little bit around. And you can see that if I did that, the CH2OH wouldn't necessarily be in the same position. If I took this thing and I flipped it upside down and then kind of rotate it around in some convoluted way, walla walla bing bing, I could eventually get it to look like this, but if I did that, and you'll have to trust me by building a model or just trust me on blind faith, it would not actually end up looking like this. This is indeed a D sugar. Whew, okay, so is it an alpha D or is it a beta D? The way we decide that is by looking at the three-dimensional orientation of the CH2OH and comparing it to the three-dimensional orientation of the OH. You'll notice that the CH2OH is pointing up and the OH is pointing up. They are both up, which means it is cis. 
Now, I've memorized that when these two guys are trans, that is an alpha anomer. When those two guys are cis, that is a beta anomer. The way I memorize that is that trans has a letter A in it and alpha has a letter A in it. And then cis, you know, by default just goes to beta. So this has a cis, therefore it is a beta anomer. So this is beta D glucose. In this last question, we're asked to determine what the correct IUPAC suffix will be for this crazy looking molecule. The correct answer is D. If you want to know why, stay tuned right now. Okay, looking at this crazy, hairy, and absolutely insane molecule, we're given the task of determining what the suffix of its IUPAC name will be. You'll notice that there are lots of different functional groups. I've got an aldehyde over here, and I've got an ether up here. I've got an alkene, that's a carbon-carbon double bond there. I've got a carbon-carbon triple, an alkyne there. I've got an alkyl iodide, that's a halide over there. I've got an alcohol over here, and I've got a carboxylic acid down there. So I've got all these different functional groups. Which of those functional groups will actually contribute to the suffix of that molecule's IUPAC name? The answer depends on which of those functional groups is the highest priority. Is it the alcohol? Is it the alkyne? Is it the aldehyde? Is it the alkyl halide? What is it? Well, you might remember from earlier in my uh, lecture on the subject, I mentioned that generally speaking, the more oxidized a carbon is, the higher on the priority scale it becomes on IUPAC. What is the most oxidized carbon here? Well, the most oxidized carbon is the one that has the most bonds to oxygen. That is this guy right here. He's got two bonds to oxygen over here, one bond to the OH down there, which means that the carboxylic acid trumps all of the others in terms of priority, which means that the suffix for this molecule's IUPAC name, which will probably be like three or four lines long, will be oic acid.